Hi, everybody. Welcome this morning um, to our 2024 virtual HOA Condo Academy, um, our July edition. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. I hope you are surviving the heat this summer, or maybe you're somewhere nice and cool um, getting away from the Arizona heat. Uh, today, our class is going to be really focused on summer planning and what you can do over the summer to kind of get ahead for your associations. So our main topic today is going to be amending CCNRs and implementing rental restrictions. Um, and then we're going to flip over and talk a little bit about your 2025 budget planning. Um, so as part of the class, we're going to be learning our five-step plan, um, which we have you know, developed over the past 25 plus years to help associations successfully amend their CCNRs. Um, we'll also provide an overview of how to provide an HOA or condo budget for your association for 2025. And um, we'll also give you that the question and answer at the end of the class today, which is probably one of our most popular features. Um, we answer every question that's submitted to us each class that we teach. So good morning, everybody, and welcome to class number seven of our firm's 2024 Virtual HOA Academy. We partner, we partnership have a partnership with the following cities uh, to teach these classes. So we'd like to give a special shout out to them and a thank you to them for having the vision to have these free classes for their residents where they can um, learn about a topic and then ask and have ask questions and have them answered in real time. So the different cities that we partner with for these classes are Avondale, Chandler, Glendale, Goodyear, Mesa, Peoria, Phoenix, Scottsdale, Surprise, and Tempe. So thank you everybody for being here today. Um, just a little introduction for those of you who might be joining us for the first time. My name is Beth Mulcahy and I am the managing partner and senior attorney for the Mulcahy Law Firm in Phoenix, Arizona. I have enjoyed working with, representing as their legal counsel, um, HOAs and condominiums in Arizona as their legal counsel for over 27 years. My firm currently represents over a thousand planned communities and condominium associations throughout the state of Arizona. I also currently serve on my HOA board and have for many years. The main topic, as I said earlier for today, that we're going to be talking about is going to be amending CCNRs, and then we're going to be talking a little bit about um, budget preparation for 2025. As always, feel free to submit your question in the Q&A box on Zoom and in the comment section on Facebook if you're joining us on Facebook Live. All questions will be answered at the end of the class, likely right around 12 o'clock or 12.15. And friendly reminder, today's session is limited to one question per attendee, and we appreciate you understanding that. We get a lot of different questions. It looks like we already have 142 people that are with us um, on our Zoom, um, and many more of you are joining us on Facebook Live today. Okay, before we get started, I always like to know who is my audience here today. So um, I'd like to start off by doing a little poll so I can find out who's here so I can best tailor our presentation today. So if you're joining us on Zoom, you're going to be seeing a poll question that's up. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, um, just let us know um, which city you are residing in. And then also let us know what your current role is. Um, and as the results start to come in, or maybe they already are coming in, um, I will talk briefly about the recent legislative session and the new laws in Arizona. Let's do a quick little 2024 legislative update. There were a number of bills introduced in the 2024 legislature this year. And uh, what I've tried to do over the past few weeks is simplify as much as possible what you need to know about these laws, because to some degree, they are kind of complex. I would be lying to you if I didn't tell you that I've spent the last couple of months thinking about what is the best way for me to summarize these so that it's really easy for everybody who's listening in on these classes to understand the laws and follow the new laws. First things first, um, the effective date or the date that these laws all become, you know, the law in Arizona is September 14th, 2024. Um, so that means that all the laws are going to take effect um, on that date. So we have a couple more months to kind of get up to speed and to determine how we can best all comply with the laws. Okay, so what I try to do is just do a breakdown of, you know, the 
nine or 10 different laws that I think you need to be aware of. I know that sounds like a lot to bite off, but best way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time. So very quickly, we're just going to do a very quick overview as we get closer to um, September 14th, when these laws become effective, we will be doing more talking on a more extensive basis. We'll probably have one class that's partially dedicated to just analyzing these laws and answering your questions too. So here are the most important things you need to know about the 2024 new legislation. So first thing, um, there was a bill this year on transfer fees or capital contribution fees. And basically that the main gist of it is is that planned communities and condominiums can't charge transfer fees or capital contribution fees in these circumstances and very limited circumstances. Most of our clients were already not doing this. Um, so you can't charge transfer fees or capital contribution fees when there's a nominal consideration paid. So like an example would be like $1 to transfer the deed from, um, you know, a familial relationship. So from the husband to the wife or from, parents to their children, or if it's still business entities from one LLC to another LLC because um, they're related in some way. So for the first, just on transfer fees is you, when there's a nominal consideration and there's a familial relationship or some sort of a business entity relationship, and that's why there's going to be a transfer of title from A to B, we cannot charge that transfer fee or capital contribution fee. I don't think that's going to have a big impact on any of the associations in Arizona because most of them were, were not doing that already. Okay, the next uh, new law, the second one, um, talks about condominium improvements. So this only applies to condominiums. Um, and basically what it says, if an owner wants to make an improvement, probably the most common one that comes to mind would be an owner wants to change from carpeting to hardwood floors. Um, and that improvement or alteration may disturb its neighbors um, in the condo association, the board cannot prohibit it um, as long as the owner purchases, installs, and pays for anything necessary to eliminate or minimize the disturbance to the neighbors. So probably how this came about is, you know, there are some condo associations that don't allow hardwood flooring. And, um, you know, basically what the legislature is saying, okay, you can't do that anymore as long as the, you know, individual owner who wants to make the alterations does whatever is necessary to purchase, install, and pay for anything that's necessary to eliminate the disturbance. So, you know, the type of things that I can see coming out of this would be the association approves the change to the hardwood floors, but the owner has to do a special sound barrier. Um, there's a special corking that you can do, and, and all of the companies that install hardwood floors would understand and know what that means or maybe that you make them have area rugs. I mean, those would just be some examples. Again, this law probably doesn't have far reaching implications for condominiums, but I'm mentioning it so that you're aware of it. The next law is kind of confusing and I wanna just simplify it as best as I can. Um, it deals with collecting assessments from owners in an association. And what we've seen over the years is a lot of regulation of associations on collection of delinquent assessments. So taking away owner, taking away the associations, kind of um, their legal remedies, watering them down, et cetera, um, to give owners more time to pay back their assessments. Um, and this year is kind of no different. Um, and so kind of what the, there's a, this law had like probably like seven or eight parts of it, but the basic thing on it is, okay, an association is trying to collect assessments from an owner after the effective date of this law, September 14th. Um, when we contact the owner regarding the debt, we have to make reasonable efforts, so the association has to make reasonable efforts to communicate with the owner and offer a reasonable payment plan prior to foreclosing. So kind of what we're suggesting to our boards is, that that first form letter that you have, you should have some, you know, language in there, settlement language, giving them an opportunity to settle the debt um, and so that you are complying with this law. Now, that can be done in a first letter, a second letter. It can be done by the attorney when it's turned over to the attorney. Um, but we have to give them some sort of reasonable payment plan or offer of a reasonable payment plan before we would ever foreclose on them. And again, this is just going to be something that we do that's form work that will be added to the letters for the collection letters that are sent to owners who pay assessments. Um, 
The other part of the law is kind of the more complicated law in terms of what can we lean for when an owner owes unpaid assessments. Now, previously, we used to be able to lean for unpaid assessments, late fees, attorney's fees on the unpaid assessments, and any collection costs. Um, the law has changed a little bit now, and basically what it says is that no matter what your document states, no matter what's in your CCNRs, um, fees and charges like self-help fees or charges charged for an owner's damage to a common area, late fees and fines and penalties um, can be collected under the common expense lien only by a civil lawsuit. So we kind of already knew that. So it's kind of going to be like these charges are going to be collected in the same way as the unpaid fines were collected. So you have to file a lawsuit to collect those, um, you know, other fees like self-help fees or damage to a common area. So we can't just go ahead and lean for those, even if your documents state that. Um, you'd have to get a judgment and then you can record the judgment. Um, Another thing that said that this law talks about is that late fees that are not expressly authorized by the association's declaration are no longer um, part of the common expense lien. Um, and so we have to do a little bit of due diligence before we lien. We want to make sure that if there are late fees um, that are on the account before we would lien the property for those late fees in addition to the assessments, we want to make sure that the association's documents authorize to charge those late fees. Um, pre Pre-judgment interest, we can no longer put on the association's common expense lien. Of course, just like fines and penalties, we can still um, you know, get a personal judgment for those. Um, Pre-judgment interest fees that you may have, and, and most of our clients, just so you know, don't really charge interest on um, Unpaid assessments, most of them just charge the late fee. Um, the kind of sticking point on this law, which is going to probably affect how you handle your collections and how you utilize your attorney for your collections, is that attorney's fees and costs now need to be awarded by the court before they can be included in the common expense assessment lien. Um, and so previously, you know, we were able to add attorney's fees to a lien without having a court judgment authorizing those attorney's fees. Now we can't do that. Now we have to take the step of getting a personal judgment um, to collect on those fees. So, um, you know, of course, um, that's going to be a change. And all the attorneys that practice in this area, um, you know, it's 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 not the end of the world, basically how we're looking at it is if we file a foreclosure against an owner, there will be some parts of the foreclosure that are secured by the assessment lien. And then there will be some parts of the foreclosure that are secured by, you know, the ability to obtain a personal judgment against the association. So we'll still be able to collect all of these. It's just the lienable amounts, the amount that we can foreclose on that is going to be more limited to, um, you know, what exactly, um, you know, is authorized by the law, <clears throat> which right now is basically just going to be the unpaid assessments and late fees if you have those authorized in your documents. So that's just a little bit of a change um, that's going to take some getting used to. But, um, you know, I feel confident that we're still going to be able to collect the attorney's fees via the personal judgment, and it's not going to be that big of a change in how we handle things. Collections. Um, a couple other things, um, an association cannot sell an owner's debt to a third party. I don't really see that coming into play very often. Like we're not selling debts to collection agencies, but we can't do that. Um, and then also how we apply payments that owners make. So like, let's say they make a partial payment on the amounts that are owed to the association. Um, we need to apply those payments made by the owners if they don't have any direction how they're to be applied, like it's not sent in with a coupon or it doesn't say in the notation on the check how it should be applied. Um, in those cases, um, you know, we have specific evidence now as to how we should apply those. So there'll be some um, additional things that management companies will need to do when an owner who's delinquent makes a payment to make sure that it's applied properly. Okay, so that's kind of the complicated one. We got that one. Um, that's a big bite out of the elephant this morning. Um, so we've kind of covered the transfer fees. We've covered condo improvements. We've covered some changes on um, what we can lean for. Um, for assessments. Um, now we're just going to switch to kind of the really easy ones. So um, we have to have an agenda now for every board meeting. 
and this applies to planned communities and condominiums. And um, we have to provide that agenda. Previously, we had to give it to the owners if they came to the meeting, right? That was the old law. We still have to do that. But in addition to that, now we also have the secretary of the association, the management company, whoever provides some notice of each meeting. Um, they're also going to have to provide an agenda at the time that you send out your notice of the meeting. And that needs to be provided to the owners by hand delivery, mail, website posting, email, or any other electronic means or posting it at the association's documents. So, you know, when the new law went into effect a couple of years ago, stating that we had to give the agenda to owners if they attended the meeting, our firm was telling all of our clients, you know, it's just good business practices to, when you send out the notice of the meeting, have the agenda there too. Now that's the law. So starting in September, um, you will need to make sure that your notice of, of your regular board meetings also includes an agenda for that meeting. Okay, another new part of the law talks about declarant control, and um, this applies only to planned communities and gives us, gives us some direction about, um, you know, when the declarant control period ends um, and other things pertaining to declarant control because it doesn't really apply to most of our associations are not still under declarant control. Just be aware if you're a planned community and you're having trouble getting your, de your developer to turn over the association to its owners, um, there is a new law that talks specifically about the process to do that. Okay, uh, mounted flight hold hold holders is another new law. Um, we always have laws on flags almost every year. I think over the past decade, we've seen you know some sort of regulation of the flags and flagpole laws. Um, this year was no exception. Associations um, under the new legislation may limit members to two wall-mounted flagpole holders. So um, I don't know, probably there was somebody out there who had a lot of flagpole holders mounted to their walls and uh, the legislature picked up on it and decided we need to limit that to two. Um, the next law talks about fair housing violations and CCNRs. And so really the bottom line on this is if your association's CCNRs contain outdated language that could be considered a violation of the Fair Housing Act. So for example, maybe it discriminates against um, a certain protected class um, or it just in, in general doesn't comply with the Fair Housing Act, um, which you know prohibits discrimination um, of protected classes. The association can amend that out without getting a vote of the membership. So just be aware that if your documents contain like any really outdated language um, that is discriminatory and in violation of the Fair Housing Act, um, there is a process for you to get that language out without having to do a uh, vote of the membership. Um, two two questions that we've kind of been receiving a lot of um, feedback on, and I mean, it's not something that I think is going to come up very often, but our casitas and um, chicken coops. So I'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking about those two. Um, so there was a law this year that talked about um, casitas and um, dwelling units um, that might be, you know, situated like in the backyard of a house. There's been a lot of publicity on this as well that, you know, the there's a law this year that was, talks about this. So you might be thinking as an association, oh, somebody's going to want to put in a guest house or they're going to want to put in a house in the back of their lot and bring in renters or whatever. Um, basically, what this law does is it doesn't supersede any of the governing documents that put restrictions or limitations on ADUs, alternate dwelling uses, or um, casitas. Um, so you can still have any restrictions that you have in your documents will still apply. So if you don't allow um, any sort of like a accessory dwelling unit um, or a casita or a guest house, that is still enforceable even with this new law that talks about, um, you know, the ability for people to do this. Um, we just have to rely now on document enforcement mechanisms and not on what the city code or ordinances may say on ADUs or casinos or guest houses. So as long as it's in your CCNRs that they can be regulated, you can still regulate them. Okay, let's talk about chicken coops. This has kind of been a hot topic over the years. So um, we've seen many different cities, municipalities talk about this. Um, it's actually very heated discussion topic. Whenever we talk about this, there's always some people very in favor of it and then some people very opposed to it. So our legislature has finally spoken, our Arizona legislature, and um, basically it says that municipalities cannot 
cannot have stricter pro prohibitions on backyard chickens than specified in this particular new law. And municipalities cannot prohibit owners of a single family detached dwelling from maintaining up to six chickens. Chickens must be enclosed. Setback requirements must be met as well. If the lot is less than one acre in size, the chicken enclosure cannot be higher than the fence line. Roosters are still prohibited. Um, chicken enclosures must be cleaned twice a week. Um, we don't know how that's going to be enforced, but that's what the state law now says. This really doesn't impact any association restrictions on chickens. Um, a lot of associations already have a prohibition on, um, you know, it typically says like fowl, people having fowl or chickens or whatever, um, undomesticated animals on their lots. Those provisions in your CCNRs would still be enforceable under the CCNRs. Um, but again, if you're having a problem on this, or you think this could be a problem in your association, now would be a good time to check your CCNRs and see if you have anything in there on, um, you know, undomesticated animals or prohibitions of, you know, poultry, poultry, fowl, chickens, etc. Um, so that if you have somebody that does do this, you are um, already thought ahead about it and what your association's position is on it. And of course, if this becomes a problem, you might want to do just a reminder to your neighbors or talk about it at your annual meeting as to what the association's documents state on this particular topic. Okay, so we covered a lot of territory on the new legislation. Um, just to recap, we talked about the transfer fees. Um, it's going to have limited, you know, impact on associations where there's, you know, non um, you know, transfer between two parties and there's like a dollar given, it's an angel familiar transfer or whatever. We can't do that. We've talked about condo improvements that may disturb other owners and the new law on that. We talked about how we're going to be changing how we do some of our assessment collection. Um, we talked about putting that agenda um, out to everybody with the meeting notice for planned communities and condominiums 48 hours in advance of your meeting. Um, we've talked about there's a provision in the doc in the new law that talks about when declarant must give up their control of the association and some other important information regarding developer controlled boards. Um, we've talked about the flight pole holders, limiting it to two. We've talked about the ability to amend CCNRs to get rid of fair housing violations just by a vote of the board. Um, you definitely want to talk to your legal counsel before you do that. And last but not least, we've talked about ADUs, casitas, and chicken coops this year. So what I tried to do is just make it as easy to understand as possible. Hopefully I was able to do that this morning in the quick little 20 minute summary that I gave. Um, as always, we will be talking more and more about this as we get closer to September 14th. So stay tuned. Um, we're also going to be putting out a very simple cheat sheet for everybody to understand that clearly explains these laws without a lot of legalese. Um, now, as you can imagine, um, it takes a little while to fine tune that. So we're going to be getting that out hopefully um, before our next Neighborhood Services Virtual HOA Academy so we can take a look at it then. Okay, let's go back up to our poll results. Looks like we have a great turnout today. Um, we have uh, 12, or excuse me, 11% from Chandler that's here today. Um, we have 4% from Glendale, 3% from Goodyear, 25% from Mesa. Wow, that's incredible. Um, 6% from Peoria, 22% from Phoenix, 20% from Scottsdale, 7% from Surprise, and 2% from Tempe. In terms of our total numbers here today, right now I'm seeing that on Zoom we have about 191 people live with us, which is amazing. Thank you so much for being here, plus many more joining us on Facebook Live this morning. Of those of you who are here today, we have 68% are board members. 13% are managers and 17% interested homeowners with 2% other. So a great representation of board members, managers, and interested homeowners today. So welcome everybody. Thank you for being here. Okay, let's dive right in and talk a little bit about um, one more topic I want to talk about briefly before we get into our main topic for today. The Corporate Transparency Act. This is something that I'm getting a lot of questions on. So we've talked about this before, you know, for the past really six months. Um, and basically, you know, associations as of right now need to still comply with the Corporate Transparency Act. Um, basically, this is a federal law 
um, that was passed to, you know, counter terrorism in our country. I don't think under any universe that it was, um, you know, directed to HOAs and condominiums throughout the United States, but based on the way it's worded, we do have to comply with it. So there's a simple form that associations have to file with information about their board members, contact information for their board members. Um, and that does need to be done by December 31st, 2024. Um, a couple things have happened recently. Um, so, you know, a particular court, a federal court ruled on March 1st that this Corporate Transparency Act was unconstitutional. Um, now, the federal government has appealed that decision shortly after the ruling. And um, FinCEN, which is the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, has provided notice that, you know, even though this case, you know, was dealed, was ruled unconstitutional and it's being appealed, um, it only applies, the result of that case only applies to the plaintiffs in that case, which kind of doesn't make sense to me because if one court says it's unconstitutional, that's problematic. But that is the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, INSA, who's kind of regulating all the paperwork for this law. So um, also a couple things have come up um, is that the uh, National Small Business Association and members of the Small Business Association, you know, are continuing to fight this. The Community Associations Institute, um, you know, also has filed an amicus brief, which is like a friend of the court brief. Um, in the United States Court of Appeals, um, you know, on behalf of the National Small Business United and Small Business Association, um, objecting to, you know, the government's requiring us to comply with the Corporate Transparency Act. So we got to stay tuned. But as of right now, we're kind of at the six month mark. Um, we do need to do some planning to make sure that, uh, you know, you are complying with this. Again, this is a really easy form. Um, our firm can will we'll be helping associations get these forms filed. Kind of the biggest pickle on this law is that anytime the board changes, or anytime the contact information for the board changes, we have to update our records with this FinCEN, um, the federal government. And so, you know, it's it's going to be challenging because we all know people move, people quit the board, people new people join the board throughout the year. So it's going to be something that's kind of living and breathing and we'll always have to be updating it anytime there's a change. So, um, you know, something you probably need to have on your radar for the second half of this year, we probably should be thinking about filing this form in the fourth quarter of 2024 to comply with the due date, um, you know, which I would have this filed before December 31st, 2024, for sure. If you are upset about this law and you're not happy about it, um, a couple of things that we can share with you. You know, we have a link, which is from a, um, you know, a CAI community associations put this link out. So if you want to get your voters voice out there and object to this new law, um, there's an action center link that we're going to be sharing with you um, on our screen. Um, you're welcome to contact me by email to ask for it. Um, and, you know, you can as a homeowner in your association, you can say, hey, I think it's crazy that we're being required to comply with this law and it's going to cost us a lot of money, etc." cetera. Um, so we want to give you the opportunity if you want to file um, something on that, um, you certainly have the resources to do that and it's circulating out there and it's you know, being sent to Congress that we're upset about it. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, amending CCNRs. Um, so great to see 190 people here today in the dead of summer, right? Usually this is not that high of a participation class because a lot of people are traveling, but I'm psyched that we have so many people here today who care about their associations and who want to learn more about what they can do over the summer to get ahead. And so the first thing I want to talk about is um, amending CCNRs. We find that you know, during the busy times of the year for associations, and that's typically, um, we find somewhere between like October through May is kind of like prime time busy for associations in our experience. Um, and it, maybe it's because we've got snowbirds coming and maybe it's because, um, you know, kids are back in school typically during that time period. 
Um, regardless, those are your really busy times. So the months of July, August, and September are great times to be working on possibly thinking about amending your CCNRs and also to work on your 2025 budget, so your budget for next year. Um, so let's start with amending CCNRs. Let's kind of talk, talk a little bit about that. What's the process? Why do we do it? So the most common reasons for amending your CCNRs would be to get rid of old restrictions, outdated restrictions that no longer apply to your association. Um, also to comply with new laws. Um, you know, maybe there's uh, changes in state law or federal law and your documents conflict with that and it's confusing to your owner, so you want to update that. Um, you also can, another reason for amending CCNRs is to get rid of provisions in there that aren't consistent with how you currently operate your association. Most common one I can think of is parking. We get a lot of questions on, hey, we've got this parking restriction that we, um, you know, have, we can't park on the streets in our association, but we don't enforce it. Everybody does it. What should we do about it? And in fact, there's a new law that was passed last year that talks about if you're a planning community and the streets are dedicated to the public, you have to take action on, on whether or not you want to keep, um, you know, being able to regulate parking on your streets. Um, and so, you know, a very common thing that we look at is, okay, things are operating one way in our association and our documents say something different. So we need to correct our documents to make them consistent with, you know, what our common practices are. Lots of times we remove developer language. We, uh, as a developer is long gone and it's confusing to owners to have all that language in there. Um, sometimes we amend CCNRs to make it easier for owners to understand. Use subheadings, shorten them up, um, condense them. So it's something that owners feel is a document that they understand and can read quickly. Um, we also sometimes are correcting conflicting provisions in the documents. If the bylaws say one thing and the CCNRs say something totally opposite, it's very confusing to members. Um, and so we you know, amend the document to make it con all the documents consistent in what they say. Um, you know, what we've done over the years is we've come up with a five-step plan that is really helpful to associations if you're thinking about amending your CCNRs. And I have been practicing law for 25 years, representing association 25 years plus plus. And what we found is this five-step plan is a success strategy that will save you a lot of time, effort, and anguish. If you follow this, you know, this will make you much more likely to be successful as part of your um, amending documents strategy. Um, so I want to share that with you. It's kind of like our secret sauce for, okay, if you're thinking about amending your association documents, what things should you do to ensure that you're successful and it passes? Because I'm going to just tell you this up front, amending CCNRs is difficult, right? In most cases, you're going to have to get approval of your membership. And, um, you know, people don't like change. And so what we want to do is package it in such a way to the owners that they can't say no, right? And that's the goal of this. So let's talk about our five-step plan. Step one is a really easy step. Basically in step one, we just determine what is required to amend the documents. So we look at whatever document we're trying to amend, like for example, the CCNRs. Typically the amendment provision is in the back of the document and we look at, you know, what, what percentage is it to amend the documents? How many owners do we need to actually get this document amended? Um, and so step one would be, you know, get your attorney involved for your association. Look at, okay, what, what exactly percentage do we need? And is there some association documents have like this weird language in there that says that um, you can only amend 90 days before any renewal. So we have to, you know, evaluate that. Does that apply here? Um, usually it does, and it makes it more difficult. Um, some association documents have a weird requirement that um, you have to have any homeowner approval signatures for the amendment be notarized. Um, and so at this point, you know, basically what we're trying to do is determine what exactly do we need in terms of who needs to approve it, when can we do this amendment, 
Um, maybe there's a weird provision in there that says that all first mortgages have to approve the amendment. So we have a strategy for how to handle that as well. So step one, get your attorney involved, figure out what exactly you need to amend the CCNRs. And it's good to get this out of the way first because if it's really difficult um, to amend your documents, like let's say you have a 90 cent, 90% approval and you have to have all the documents notarized or something, um, that's gonna be hard. And so getting feedback from your attorney as to, okay, how do we tackle that? Maybe we tackle that by amending the amendment provision you know, because that's so uncontroversial, it probably will be easier to get the 90% and get the signatures notarized, right? Or, um, you know, we just analyze it in this step. So step one, what do we need to amend the documents? Okay, step two, this is kind of the longer step. And th in this step, um, we review the documents and come up with the changes. And so basically what we do is we take the document that you're trying to amend, like let's say the CCNRs, and we put it into a Word document and we use the track changes function and we just start making changes to the document. And what I prefer as legal counsel, and I think this saves money for the association, is for me to do the first draft. Um, and why do I say that? Because if the board does the first draft of the changes, I have to go in sometimes and change what they changed. And it's extra work and it costs more to do that. So it's smarter and more cost efficient just to have your attorney do the first draft off of the documents. Um, and what we do is we use the track changes. I read through the document maybe five, six, seven times, continue to make changes each time I review it. It typically takes about a month for our firm to do this. Um, if we need it on an expedited basis, we can do it a little faster. But for the most part, it's, you know, two weeks to four weeks would be what I would say is our sweet spot on, on getting these reviewed. Um, after we review them and come up with our changes using the track, track changes feature, we give it to the board. We ask them to take a look at it. We ask the board to make any changes that they may want. Um, anything that they may want to have added, give us feedback on it and we can write that in or maybe they give us proposed language. And so in step two, basically we're making the changes. Um, I'm looking at it with the legal eagle eye um, I am also incorporating any changes that the board may want to make. And at some point, after maybe one or two drafts, we've got the document right where we want it. Like, okay, I like what I'm seeing in terms of the changes. The board is happy with what's, you know, we're proposing to change. And so at that point, we're at the end of step two. Um, step three is the step that all my clients like to skip, but it is the most important step. So I don't want you to ever skip this. Step three is when we take the document that both the attorney and the board agree, this is a good document, we like the changes here. Step three, we take that document and we send it to the homeowners, whether by email or we put it on our webpage or you mail it, and we ask for their input. Tell us what you think about these changes. And the reason why we do that is because we don't wanna spend all the money working on these changes and then find out you know, when we're voting on it that, hey, I don't like this document. And there's a lot of people who don't like this document. Um, you know, if we, you know, rush to the vote and skip step three, we lose valuable feedback from the owners about how they feel about the amendment. So I really strongly encourage all boards um, to ask the homeowners for feedback, give them two weeks, a month, um, say, here's what we're thinking about doing. Please give us your comments and give them a little comment card. Tell them how they can email the board. Now, in my experience, you're not going to have very many people that comment on it. Maybe five, six people, maybe less. But the feedback that you get from those homeowners is going to be invaluable. Um, they may say, I don't want this provision. And usually, if there's one or two people who are really upset about something, it's usually an indicator that this section is going to be something that could be controversial and could potentially not get the required votes that we need to amend it. So we need to hear that feedback. I mean, as legal counsel for the association, I can tell you that typically controversial topics for CCNR amendments are gonna be transfer fees, rental restrictions, anything giving the board more power than they already have. People are sometimes gonna question that. Um, but it's good to get the feedback from the owners too. Okay, so step three, you know, we, we send out the documents to the owners, ask them for their feedback. We get probably a few people give us feedback. Step four 
is we evaluate the feedback with legal counsel and we come up with what our strategy is for the final document that we're going to send out for the vote. So maybe we put something in there that we got a lot of negative feedback on and people, you know, don't want that, right? If that's the case, um, you know, what I would recommend is either you just get rid of it, delete it entirely from the document, or maybe you separate that out and vote on that separate. So just that issue has its own line on the ballot to vote on. Um, you know, and just tweak strategy discussions on the feedback from the owners is going to help you make good choices to get the votes that you need. Um, and so maybe we, we rewrite a few sections after hearing the feedback that, hey, we think this is unclear. This needs to be more specific. Um, so step four is really the time that we strategize about the feedback we receive from the owners. We come up with the final draft language after getting the feedback from the owners. And we plan out when we're going to send this document out for voting. A really good time um, to send these documents out, and now we're moving into step four, um, is in conjunction with your annual meeting, because that's typically when we have the highest percentage of people who are participating in voting. Um, but there are other times, too, that you can um, you know, send out amendments to CCNRs. It's just we want to be strategic. Like, you probably don't want to send out an amendment to CCNR ballot you know, and July 4th, right, around July 4th, and then ask for it back by July 30th because so many people are traveling in the summertime because it's so hot in Arizona. So if you do do that, you may want to get like a longer time period, like through December 31st or something, um, so that you have enough time to get the requisite percentage that we need. So all of this strategy is occurring in step four, and we come up with the final amendments. We uh, create the ballot we create the timeline for the return of the ballot. Um, and then we finally send out the final document. And what I recommend is you send out the document red line so people can see what's changed. People get anxious if they see a totally new document and they don't know what's been changed. So, um, you know, be transparent and have all those changes red lined using the track changes. Have the ballot be easy to understand. Have it be clear on the ballot how long they have to vote on this. Um, and as part of step four, you know, I always tell the board, be strategic. So, um, let's say we're sending out the ballot now and the end date to return it is December 31st. Um, what I would suggest is that on a monthly basis that we look at how many ballots have been returned and continue to remind the people who haven't voted, Hey, we need your vote on this important issue. We send it to them by email. Um, and we keep track of where this is going to our ultimate goal, you know, December 31st is to have the votes that we need. So um, really in July and August, we should probably be getting, you know, monthly updates as we get into the fall. Well, I would be sending multiple emails a month to people who haven't voted in order to try to get them to vote. Also, always have those ballots available at the board meeting in case somebody shows up. We send them the ballots so they don't have to go look for it in their pile on their desk. Anytime we send out the request for them to vote on it, um, make it easy for them to vote. Um, another thing that some boards do is that they have like a coffee, coffee and donuts at the park or at the pool um, to encourage people to vote or to answer any questions that people may have. Um, and that's a really successful tool to try to get people more involved. The last step is step five, um, and that is you've reached your goal. You received the requisite number of votes or percentage that you needed to amend documents. Um, once you hit that step for different documents, there's different procedures. So for the CCNRs, uh, we have 30 days to record the amendment once we get the requisite vote. So we want to be very careful on that timeline, make sure that we don't blow that. Um, that gets The document gets recorded with the Maricopa County Recorder's Office. However, the attorney is who wrote the amendments will help you with the final amendment language on the documents and will help you get it recorded. If it's a bylaw amendment, typically those are just kept with the association's records and they are not recorded. So basically just getting the final paperwork for that, having the board members sign the bylaws as amended um, and then placing that in the association's records. Um, if it's articles of incorporation, we have to file those with the corporation commission um, rules are basically just put with the association's records. 
anything that's amended and it's passed, make sure that you notify your owners that it's passed and have easy access for them to get the, you know, the new document that's been passed. Um, you know, a couple thoughts on this would be make sure that if you use a management company or whoever's providing disclosure statements to potential buyers, make sure that they're giving the new amended document to the buyer and that they're not giving the old CCNRs, you know, we want to make sure that we're giving everybody the most updated information. So after that document's um, recorded, if it's a CCNRs, you want to make sure that whoever's handling those disclosure packages to new buyers who are purchasing in your association that they're getting the updated CCNRs too. And have them on your website. Have all the updated versions on your website is always a great idea. Um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, rental restriction amendments. And, um, you know, we have also had case law over the past, you know, couple of years that's kind of put a damper on our amendments. Um, and so I think a couple of things that I want to just mention about, um, you know, amendments in the amendment process. Okay. Rental restriction amendments typically are pretty controversial. Um, sometimes you have a lot of support, like people see, oh, we don't want VRBOs coming into our association and we don't have any right now and we want it, don't want any in the future. And so maybe, you know, it's pretty easy if you're a small association to get an amendment like that passed, either prohibiting short-term rentals or, um, you know, putting some sort of a restriction, like we're going to grandfather everybody that currently owns, but anybody who purchases in the future, um, you know, they will, um, you know, not be able to rent. Um, and so there, there are ways to implement rental restrictions, but they're controversial. You definitely need legal advice um, in terms of how we're going to structure it, what's going to work best for your association. I always like to, I ask the question always when a client comes to me with a rental restriction uh, possibility to amend their documents is what percentage are currently renting because they're not going to vote yes on this. Um, and so we, there's a, a strategy if you're thinking about implementing a rental restriction amendment. Um, another factor here is that there was a case uh, that was decided about two years ago called the Callway case. Um, and that case is making it more difficult for associations to do amendments in general. Basically, the um, amendments have to be reasonable and they would have had to be foreseeable um, under that particular court case in order for the amendments to be upheld. Um, and so that's an added layer of analysis that we need to do if we're looking at the amendments that you're proposing, like, hey, could this potentially be challenged under the Callaway case? Um, and your legal counsel will help assist you navigate that process. I have not seen, since that case was decided uh, by the Supreme Court of Arizona, I haven't seen any challenges filed by owners um, against associations for amendments, um, saying that the amendments were not foreseeable or that they were not reasonable. Um, so I think we've done a really good job navigating that case and some of the restrictions that they put in uh, under that case to help our clients still be able to proceed forward with amendments. So. Just wanted to mention that because there's a lot of discussion about the Callaway case and you know that maybe we can't amend our CCNRs anymore. That's not our experience, but you just want to be really mindful of how you do it and make sure that whatever you're trying to change, that we have a strategy so that if it's challenged under Callaway, it's defensible. Okay, let's talk a little bit about budget planning, our last topic for this morning. Um, the month of July, August, September, and October are your key budget planning months for the next fiscal year. Now, most associations have a fiscal year on date that is December 31st. And so you need to have your 2025 budget. Typically, it should be approved by the association's board either in November or December. If you're lucky, you get it approved in October. And if, if that's the game plan, hey, we need this approved in the last quarter of 2024, all the prep work needs to occur now. And so I want to talk a little bit about how to plan your budget. Um, and one great thing with two really good cheat sheets um, right now um, that I'm sure my office is sharing with you, or you can find them on our website. Um, and the first one was on amending CCNRs. The second one now is on budget, how to create a budget for your association. So basically, what is a budget? Let's just back it up a little bit for the, some of you who may be newer to your board or the community association industry. A community association budget is like an itemized summary of anticipated income, like assessment income coming in, 
and expenses for each fiscal year of your association. Um, most association documents require you to adopt a budget as a board. Um, and budget pr preparation is typically starting right about now. You should be thinking about it in July, August, and September. And we're going to go through the steps that you should be following over the next three months. Um, you also should check your governing documents to see if there's any specific requirements for your budget. Like, do you have to get homeowner approval of your budget? Most of you don't. Like, 90% of you probably don't, but there are some, in some instances, some condominiums do have to do that. So you want to make sure you're checking the documents. Um, who prepares the budget? Typically, it's either the management company or maybe you have like a financial committee for your association. And they're the ones that takes the first stab of the budget. It's typically in an Excel spreadsheet. Anybody needs a sample budget, um, I'm happy to provide you one. All you have to do is email me at bmulkiki at mulkihilawfirm.com and I'm happy to provide you for free a budget um, in an Excel format so you can kind of see how it works and how the formulas work in computing the budget. Um, but typically the management company does the first draft of it if you have one. If you don't have a management company, it's going to be a financial committee or the treasurer for your association. Um, some key points on the budget are going to be it takes time and planning and analysis of you know, the past six to 12 months, what our expenses have been to project for the future, what we think our expenses will be in 2025. Um, in some cases, um, you know, we, we want to go to the steps for preparing the budget now. So the budgeting process begins by reviewing the association documents. We talked about that already. Are there any special requirements for the budget? Um, you know, we, the next thing is, you know, when, when do we have to have this budget approved? And I said a few minutes ago, the goal would be October, November, or December at the latest of 2024 to have the budget approved. So how do we prepare the budget? So, um, you want to look at last year's budget. So maybe look at the first half of 2024 and maybe even all of 2023 and look at the numbers. The year-to-date budget shows, or should show, if you're doing it correctly, um, what the budget amount was and then what the actual amount is that's spent. Now, what we're hearing from a lot of clients is that they are way over budget on water and electricity in 2024. Maybe you were involved in a lawsuit and your legal fees are much higher than what you had budgeted for the legal fees. Um, and so what you want to do is kind of look at last year's budget and the records and compare the difference between the year-to-date budget and, you know, what was what you had anticipated and what it actually is. Um, then think about what do we have on deck for next year, for 2025? Do we need to paint the buildings? You know, do we anticipate bringing on a management company if you don't have one? Um, are we going to be hiring employees that we may need to do a line item for them? Are we seeing a trend in our water bills going up 20% or is, did we receive notification from our landscaper or management company that they're raising their fees? Um, so really think about all of those different factors. Like, are there going to be any changes in 2025 that we can anticipate based upon the information that we have? Um, you know, and the next step would be ask questions of the vendors, maybe reach out to any vendors and say, do you anticipate any fee increases or do you anticipate any charges for our association? Like maybe your pool company may say, well, I feel like the pool pump, even though, you know, it's supposed to have a life of 10 years, I think it's probably, it's just sputtering right now. and We're doing a lot of mechanical maintenance on it. I'm not sure it's going to make it. So maybe we should factor in another five grand into our budget just in case it doesn't make it through this year or whatever, or there's going to be more repairs until we, you know, eventually have to, you know, get the new um, motor for, you know, that pool pump or whatever. Um, also ask them, are you going to raise your rates um, or do you anticipate anything? You know, are you, you know, tree trimming? Is, are we going to be doing more tree trimming this year than we've done in the past, et cetera? Um, look at the association's documents. We already talked about this the third time I'm saying it. It's really important. Make sure you check your documents about budgeting. Is there anything special in there that we have to, to do? We have to tick a box, get a vote of the members, or is this just something that the budget can be approved at a regular board meeting by a majority of the board? Um, after you get the information about uh, 
you know, any changes that you think, any extra expenses you're going to have for your association, and you've analyzed the data for, you know, maybe the past six to 12 months prior, um, then you can start putting in numbers what you think the each line item on the budget is going to, you know, what the expense is going to be for each one of those line items based upon the data that you've received. Um, one suggestion that I have that honestly has saved me and my association, I was the treasurer of my association for about three years, um, is we always had a line item for unexpected or miscellaneous expenses. Um, and for my association, I think our budget is about $2.5 million. Um, and our, just to give you kind of an analysis of the numbers, I think we had about $40,000 in that um, separate category that was for unexpected or miscellaneous expenses that may come up um, that are surprises because anybody who's ever served as a treasurer of association knows there are always surprises. It's just like your own, when you have your own home, you know, you never expect the water heater to go out, but when it does, you know, you got to pay for it. So same thing. Um, you know, have that extra unexpected or miscellaneous expense line item, um, you know, for your association. And a good way to look at what you think that should be, look at the past five years of budgets. How over budget were we? Um, and that might be the number. Maybe, you know, a good way to do it would be to analyze those five years and then come up with the number that you want to put in that line item for 2025. Um, you know, budget the amount to be placed at each line item. So, you know, there's typically line items for like management company costs and, um, you know, landscaping, legal. And if you want a sample belt, a sample budget, like I said, you can talk to me and I'll give it to you. Um, and then you put in the expenses, you know, for each one. And then after you have all of your expenses, then typically what happens is then you kind of backtrack and then you look at, okay, well, we have, let's make this easy, 100 owners. Um, and you look at the total expenses that you have based upon your estimated budget, and then you divide that by the number of homeowners. And that's going to be, you know, your annual assessment. You divide that by 12, and then that will be your monthly assessment. And having done the budget many, many times, I think I've served on my board now over 14 years, what I can tell you is you never go with the first draft of the budget, right? You start playing with the numbers a little bit. Um, maybe you get a little sticker shock when you look at all those expenses that you think are anticipated and how much of an increase that's going to be for your community um, members to pay each month. Um, and maybe you're, you're looking at factors like, hey, we can only increase the annual assessment rate up to 10% without a vote of membership. So if we go over that, if your documents say that, if we go over that, now we need to get a vote of members, which... I think anybody who's on a board knows that's going to be a tough sell, right? Um, but one thing I want to mention is all these factors need to be, you know, considered in this timeline right now, July, August, September, October. Um, because if you do need to have a vote, you're going to need to do that in October and November for sure in order to have this be ready to go by January 2025. Um, a couple other thoughts, you know, on the, the budget. Um Think about, do we need to lower the membership for the increase? Play with the numbers a little bit. You know, maybe you lower that miscellaneous expense one, take it from 40 to 5,000 or whatever. How does that affect the budget? And if you're doing this in an Excel spreadsheet with formulas in it, it's going to automatically compute those changes. So it's really helpful um, if you have it set up that way. And most management companies do. Um, you know, Depending on what your documents say about the budget process, most boards are able just to, you know, talk about the budget. I recommend doing this. Talk about the budget, you know, at least one month. Um, go through it line item as part of your board meeting, and then maybe the next month vote on it, or maybe you have to do it the same month you talk about it and you vote on it. Um, you know, but as much input to the homeowners that you can give is helpful because they're looking at, hey, the expenses are going up and they may not understand why. So if there's a, a larger increase, there should be a communications plan put in place to notify the owners why. And what we found is most associations need to have somewhere between a three and 6% increase just to meet their, you know, inflation expenses. Um, so one thing that concerns me sometimes I hear from boards, oh, we haven't raised our assessment in 10 years. We've done really good. And I'm thinking that's not 
good because all the other things on your line item expenses on your budget have gone up in costs and you are you know shrinking the amount of money that you have for your association by not increasing it um, to meet your expenses um, and what does that usually mean it usually means deferred maintenance meaning that you aren't doing things that you should be doing to properly maintain the property because you don't have enough money because you're not increasing it enough to meet the cost of living expenses um, and so these are just some tips as you're navigating the budget. I'm here to support you. If you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to our firm. And um, I'm happy to strategize with you about, you know, preparation of the budget and how to get the homeowners buy-in if you have to do a large increase or maybe even a special assessment to fund, um, you know, capital improvement projects, et cetera. Um, okay, a couple things to think about here um, as we're kind of rounding out the, the morning. Um, you know, don't forget this is a very important time for, you know, budget preparation. Um, one cheat sheet that you may want to take a look at is our cheat sheet on reserve studies and funding. Um, you know, reserves are going to be the long-term planning for your capital improvements in your association. So I recommend you take a look at the cheat sheet that we have on reserves. I think that's very helpful. Um, and if you have any questions on reading financial statements or, uh, you know, how to read the financials of your association, just as part of the budget process, um, we have a great balance, uh, how to read a balance sheet, um, summary that we are going to be sharing with you here too. It's called how to read an HOA or condo association balance sheet. Um, that can be found at www.activerain.com. And my office is also going to be sharing the link with you. So that's it for today. We got through a lot. Had a great presentation talking about the new legislation, Corporate Transparency Act, amending CCNRs, and budget preparation for 2025. Our firm's next live virtual First Friday event is going to take place on Friday, August 2nd at 9 a.m. That's your chance to log into Zoom and or Facebook Live and ask a question, and I provide a live answer right then and there. Um, so please consider joining us for that. Our next virtual HOA Academy, um, HOA Condo Academy, will be class number eight in August. And that will take place on the third Tuesday of the month, like it always does, which is Tuesday, August 20th at 11 a.m. And the topic is going to be, what is a community association? Which we had a lot of questions on that today. Like, what's a planned community? What's a condominium? How does this all work together? How does it operate? Um, and secrets of successful associations. Um, which you really want to tune in on because the goal of serving for your on your board is to get things done, to accomplish things, to limit conflict, to make improvements to your community. Um, and so we're going to tell you what's the secret sauce to make your association successful. And we have 25 years experience plus, and I can tell you the boards that are successful, what they do. So it's almost like a little board improvement, self-improvements for board seminar. Um, hope you'll tune in for that next month. Um, thank you so much for joining us here today. Really appreciate you being here. Um, you can sign up for any of our classes or First Friday or our Neighborhood Services um, HOA Academy via our website at mulcahylawfirm.com. Lastly, and most importantly, we want your feedback. So if you wouldn't mind, we genuinely and sincerely appreciate it if you'd give our firm a review on Google or on Yelp. We're going to be sharing a link in the chat um, on how to leave a review. We are always happy to get feedback from our valued you know, participants and from our clients about how we're doing. If you like these classes, it's really important for us to get feedback so that we can then provide them to the neighborhood services departments. And this is the best way to do it. Um, so if you wouldn't mind doing that for us, I would be um, grateful so that then we can provide that feedback back to the neighborhood services departments so that they know that these classes are valuable and we should continue them going forward. Hope everybody's having a great summer and I look forward to seeing, you, to seeing everybody again in August. Take care. Bye.